So welcome everyone, um, this is the first of my kind of monthly wildlife journals and I'm going to just show you some of the live stream cameras and the trail cams and some of the things I've been seeing around the garden and the fields and the woods around here uh, including that robin singing um, just over the past couple of weeks and very, it's going to be very much um, a bit of a summary of the, the month's wildlife so this is what's been around in March so I'm going to start um, by having a bit of a look at, uh, we're going to have a look at the, the Badger cameras, is that right? So Deirdre is going to be helping me today, are we going to, going to have a look at the Badger cameras? Sounds great. Okay, so we'll go over to that right now. you can see there was the badger coming out and having a look around and then they're very tired just now the the sows are very tired because the youngsters are underground and they're spending a lot of time taking out old dirty bedding that have been fouled by the small small cubs and then replacing it with new fresh bedding and they're so active just now because we've had a few wet days so they've not been out very much and they don't want to bring in wet bedding they want to wait until it's dry so that's why it's so active so it, it looks like that's happening several times. Uh, is 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 that the same footage you're playing over again, or is is that? Yeah, they... well, that's uh, that's just a lot of bedding. That's a lot of bedding. So it must have taken out all the bedding that was down the, the burrow in the set, and then had to replace it. And you can see how tired it was. So it's doing that on top of looking after the cubs and feeding itself. And producing all the milk that is needed and then doing all that housework that's a pretty pretty serious spring cleaning to do. And, and where's the daddy badger during all of this oh uh, well i can tell you the daddy badger has been around the garden quite a bit and has dug up and um, where all my potatoes were and has been yeah a bit of a slob really so um, i don't want to draw any conclusions from that <laughs> anyway, so we'll go back and have another look at uh, some of the other bits of footage we got of the badgers here That's great, there's a lot of activity going on. Um, so it's very much uh, the first little spell of spring just now and uh, we've got a few things going on. The oyster catchers are back on the beach, that's really exciting. Um, they start calling at night round the house, you can make a heck of a racket but it's lovely to hear. And they try and nest most years but they're not really very successful. The beach here is quite busy with people coming to visit which is great. Um, but it's difficult for them to successfully raise their chicks. So in the past 10 years that we've been here, only twice have we seen oyster catcher chicks. Um, but they're, yeah, let's have a little look, look at them uh, down on the shore just now.
but uh, what I want to share with you as well is just a little bit of footage I got from last year when they managed to get a successful nest and then they were able to to raise one chick and uh, it was out on the beach every day for a couple of months. It was great to see it growing up and then eventually fledging and flying away. So let's have a look at the, the nest from last year. How do you know that, that that chick relates to those parents? Well you can see the, the adult birds looking after it, so the oyster catchers are really interesting. All the other wading birds, the youngsters hatch and then they immediately, within a day, they, they're often fending for themselves. The, the adult birds will brood over them and keep them warm and warn off predators until you know, they kind of calls at them to, to warn them to hide. Only one wading bird feeds its chick, and that is the oyster catcher. So the, um, there would be one adult would be looking after the chick, keeping an eye on it. The other one would be off in the fields, ranging over big distances to get food and bring it back. So. That's amazing. And have, have oyster catcher numbers gone up or down over the last, say, 50 years? That's a really good question, because oyster catcher numbers have been going up uh, in comparison to almost all the other waders which rely on marshy habitat, which is disappearing. Oyster catchers have been able to move into habitat, which is very man-made. So they've been able to nest on rooftops, which other waders couldn't do because they wouldn't be able to, well, the young wouldn't be able to feed there. But the oyster catchers can go off. They can be in the middle of the town. They can fly out to the fields or into the parks and gardens, get food and commute a mile or two back to feed the chicks. So it's amazing. So um, let's talk uh, a little bit more about some of the other wildlife that we've had around here. Um, we had some snow just a couple of weeks ago and there were loads of otter tracks all over the place. Um, and just now is when the otter behaviour begins to change quite a lot. They move from the, the river and from the, the little coastal area we have here and they move inland along the ditches and little streams and into the ponds where they're checking out uh, hunting areas for frogs and the frogs are beginning to spawn right now and the otters are moving up away from the river into these ponds so let's have a little bit of uh, let's have a little bit of a look at the footage that we got from one of these ponds it's a really big reedy edged little loch and really just up the road here so we'll have a look at that just now So we saw some really great footprints, didn't we, dear, of the otters in the snow just two weeks ago. And it was amazing the amount of activity there was, because we, we see otters maybe every week or two. Um, there was one we saw a couple of days ago. But um, yeah, it was a, you, you must be surprised by the amount of footprints and things that we saw around the place. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. But, but how, how can you tell an otter footprint from, say, a dog? Right. So all the weasel family have five pad marks like that, like we do. And uh, so an otter will have the five pad marks, whereas a dog has the four pad marks. So you can really easily see the difference. But also just the habitat. So you'll see, you'll see what the otter is doing. It could be padding in and out of the water. And then they love to slide on their bellies. So in the snow, you could see places where they just slid right down from where they've been resting 
and tobogganed down into the water. So um, let's have a, another little look at some things we've been seeing. I was very excited today and uh, we had the shell duck back for the first time this spring. So that for me that's the first proper sign of spring. Um, and they were feeding in the mud out in the river here just in front of the studio. So I want to show you a little bit of that. You've seen the shell duck before. They're you huge, Dick. So why are they so huge? They're, well, they're you're thinking about it wrong, dear drink. They're they're not they're not big ducks. They're small geese. So they're kind of halfway between being a duck and a goose. And the build is really quite goose-like, isn't it? If you have a look at them, but they're very brightly coloured. So from a distance, they look kind of black and white. But then they've got this not just this kind of reddy brown along the chest, but the bits that look black are very um, shiny, almost petroly. So the kind of greenish sheen on the head and on some of the feathers down the back and this bright red bill as well. So we'll have another quick look at that. Where have they migrated from? Yeah, so another good question. Almost all the shell duck in this country head off to Holland in the winter. So they're they're off in the Vaden Sea in this shallow sandy shoreline, which is great for them because they dabble around in the mud, the shallows and, and feed little insects and crustaceans and things out of the mud, invertebrates and things like that. But they come back here to breed. And they breed in holes, they breed in rabbit holes or holes they've dug. But uh, <clears throat> I don't think I've seen this in the literature anywhere, but I've seen several nests which are actually way high up in trees and holes in trees. And the chicks, when they hatch, they leave the nest within a day. And they'll have lots of chicks, they can have 12, 13, 14 chicks. And they ought to jump out of the hole down to the ground, fluttering as they go to try and break their fall. And how many of them survive? They're, they're a really interesting bird because the, um, there's maybe a hundred pairs of shell duck on the Tay estuary here. <clears throat> and they're long-lived birds. They'll live for five, ten, maybe twelve years. So they'll produce a lot of chicks. Um, but very few of the chicks survive. What happens is that the chicks hatch, the parents bring them down to the river, and then all the, all the birds on the river swim down and congregate at the mouth of the river here. It's a really big river. It's the biggest river in Scotland, the biggest river in Britain, um, and it's a very tidal, rough water. But they congregate there in what's a really a big creche with just a few adults looking after lots and lots of chicks. But uh, you're right, sadly, very few of them survive, but that's all that's needed for the population to continue. It's just a few chicks surviving every year. So lots going on just now. The uh, the dawn course is just beginning with song thrush, blackbird, robin. Blackbirds are very active. They're not quite started nest building here, but uh, the the males and females are sort of chasing each other around, and a lot of um, territorial behaviour by the by the male blackbirds. So tell us about the dawn course. What's that actually about? I think of dawn course as May, but what's it all about? What why is it starting now? So it's starting now because. The birds are establishing territories. Bird song sounds fantastic, but really it's just lots of angry birds shouting, keep out, this is mine, or here I quite fancy you, <laughs> come on over here. So um, these are birds establishing territories, and the birds with the best territories um, are most likely to attract mates and are most likely to have the, 
best mates and the best foraging and nesting areas and are more likely to succeed. So it's a really important thing for them to establish a territory. And as we've been talking, there have been lots of birds calling and even beginning to sing round about here. So the, the birds that we're hearing singing now are the more resident birds, the, the blackbirds, song thrushes, robins, dunnocks, sparrows, things that are nesting relatively early. In a few weeks' time, we'll start to get the migrant birds arriving and they nest later in the year and we'll start to hear them. And that's when the dawn chorus reaches its peak where we've got all the population of the birds together. And, and how long does it take to establish territory? It can be a matter of minutes, hours. What you've got to remember is it's a really fluid situation. So if one bird is killed by a cat or injures its wing or loses its voice or gets a bit ill or something like that, immediately other birds will be wanting to take its territory and move in and take those resources. Um, so practically these territories are probably being established over the course of a few days, maybe a week or two, and then maintained vigorously, which is what is going on with this, this singing just now. Um, the birds aren't putting so much energy into raising chicks and feeding chicks, they're concentrating on getting territory and holding it. So um, the nice thing about having the otter camera down on the pond was that uh, we got to see some of the ducks coming in as well to the edge of the loch. So um, we've got uh, some footage of the, the teal, they're pairing up just now. They don't nest here, they'll go further north, probably up into Scandinavia and nest there, but they're already beginning to pair up and uh, they look fantastic in their spring plumage. So why do they not nest here? There's not a great deal of suitable habitat for them. There are just a few pairs which nest, particularly further north, up in kind of marshy highland lochs, things like that. And there may be one or two places here in Fife where I live where they nest. There's places at Morton Lochs and on Loch Leven. And these are relatively large areas of undisturbed marshy edged waters. And that's ideal habitat for them. But um, no, they're, they're traveling much further to find large areas of good habitat for nesting. So what else have we got? Uh, we, had, we had a really interesting thing just a few days ago. I'm not going to tell you where this was, but uh, there are lots of beavers on the Tay. There's probably a hundred or more living, but they're further up. Um, there are some just a couple of miles away, and only three times have we seen them outside the house in the river, looking a bit lost. But we, we had one turn up very close to here, and it stayed for just a night, we think, and it nibbled down four or five little saplings. And um, I've not got any footage, but you can see the, the photos that I took just here. And you can see it's just snipped them down. But there, there wasn't uh, enough habitat here that was suitable for them, I think. So it was just this was just a, an animal coming in, having a look around, having a bit of a nibble, and then going away again. And how long have we had beavers in Scotland, Derek? Ah, uh, the first ones I saw here were maybe 15, 12 or 15 years ago. And what I hope to do in the next couple of months is get some, some more good footage from further upriver. And we can show you that. Um, but they've become known about, I would say, in the past six, seven, maybe eight years. And their, their numbers have really rocketed and they're spreading into more distant river systems. So they've moved from here onto the Forth and onto the Clyde. So they're really interesting, really valuable in the environment, keystone species in the ecology. Uh, but they do present a real challenge which needs to be managed in terms of interaction with them um, with 
farming particularly and also forestry management. So that's a real challenge, particularly down here where they're interacting with far more tended, managed environments. Anyway, what else am I going to tell you about? Um, why don't you tell me about the political controversy around beavers? No, we'll leave that for another one. That's an another entire programme, I think. Ah. So um, I'll sharpen pitchforks and ready the vats <laughs> and boiling oil for that one. We'll do a special on that. So keep posted, follow the channel. Remember to like and subscribe. And uh, yeah, tune in for the next one we do. Very about exciting. The, the Battle of the Beavers. Maybe I'll be very careful about how I label that. <laughs> So um, we've had a look at the oyster catchers, the shell duck, um, it's, get, it's getting dark just now, it's the end of the day and I've got nest boxes up at the back of the house which are fantastic for the tree sparrows which move in. They don't really lay eggs till yeah, the end of April, beginning of May but they're getting a bit boisterous now and each pair is trying to bag the best nest box. So uh, yeah, you can, see, you can see this now where they're just hanging out ready to go in and they sleep in the nest boxes at night. question maybe but you specifically said tree sparrow you know how many types of sparrow are there so we get two types of real sparrow here in the UK we've got the house sparrow which you're all familiar with and the tree sparrow which was famously declared an enemy of the people by the Chinese communist regime back in the 1950s and um, something that was thought to lead to the great famine in China and the death of millions of people and um, that is another program that I need to I need to earmark to produce but uh, we've got a few birds which either colloquially or um, by association have, have been given the name of sparrow so the hedge sparrow or dunnock um, although it's not a true sparrow is widely known as a sparrow and of course you know, historically people would see a small bird and go oh that's a sparrow so um, this has been great fun uh, showing you what's been out and about in the past uh, couple of weeks. I hope to do this every month, so remember to like and subscribe and you can follow what I'm doing and uh, keep up to date with uh, the wildlife round and about here. So thanks very much. It's been great having Deirdre here. Thanks very much. <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching and see you next time.